بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله أرسله الله تعالى بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراج منيرا فصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Indeed all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessings be upon his final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi brothers and sisters to what is I hope bi'ithnillah ta'ala uh, the beginning of what will be um, a source of blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that on this night of Al-Jumu'ah the Laylatul Jum'ah that we will uh, go through the words of our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that there is no greater speech than the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Al-Quran not just for one particular people but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Al-Quran للناس كافة, for the whole of mankind for everybody now there are people who are heedless there are people who are ignorant about the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though that the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if a person follows it and believes in it and understands it will be a source of guidance for that person in this life and in the hereafter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this kitab as a nur as a, as a light for us as a furqan, as a criterion for us. And does upon every be a believer to follow this and adhere to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are those who are heedless of this and there are those who know. And those people who know and those people who don't know that they are not the same. And cannot expect the same treatment in the hereafter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who submitted those who pondered, those who worshipped and strived for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they will have their reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who were heedless, those who were ignorant, those who were arrogant and had pride in their hearts and they turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they can only expect the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't merely just say that they will only expect the mere punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah jalla wa ala his punishment is his adl is his justice so for all of us how many of us that we have been encouraged to to go through and recite and memorize Quran there are projects there are lessons that are set up from one place to the next to go through the Quran some of these projects are 10, 15, 20 years long and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of those who undertake such an endeavor to complete a blessed endeavor. Because there's nothing better than any one of us wanting to really know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. That this, this mu'ajizah, this miracle that was given to an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is its reality? What does it mean? When you are a Muslim and you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, when you make that declaration of faith, and you accept Al-Qur'an as your book of guidance, what does that really mean to you? So I hope inshallah ta'ala and I, for myself, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us al-ikhlas, to give us a sincerity and purity of heart, that he subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to benefit and ponder over his words, for us to reach an understanding and in a state of knowing what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from me. Because that is a tafsir, that is exactly what tafsir is. Nothing more and nothing less than that. That when you read the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want to know the intended meaning. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is he telling me? What is he telling me in this verse? That you seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you read ayat from the Qur'an 
and that you understand something else that Allah doesn't want that from you. For this reason, you find the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that they would be constantly in touch with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there when the revelation was being revealed asking questions about the meanings of the Qur'an so that nothing would pass them by. And in different narrations that they would memorize five ayat and they wouldn't go past those five until that they had benefited and learned all that was in those five ayat. And in other narrations that there were ten ayat. So they were a people, radiallahu anhum, tamassaku bi kitabillah, that they held on strongly to the kitab and to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the stronger the hold that you have, the more engaged you are with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greater the difference that you will find in your life. The further you are away from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the further you are away from really truly worshipping and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from this tafsir of Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala which we will use as a, a primary source of trying to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us in Al-Qur'an. So our intended meaning or the intention behind studying such a subject like tafsir is for us to understand Al-Murad the intended meaning behind what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us of. And that you don't want to understand something which is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. And for, based upon this, that many of the ulama, from them, Imam Zarqani, Zarqani, and also up to modern day scholars like Manna al-Qattan, rahmatullahi alayhim, that when in defining what tafsir really is, that they say, al-bayan, Muradu kalam Allah. That is the clarification of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that comes extra than that, that gives you benefits that you may take from the ayah, then this is not the core of what really tafsir is. Of course, tafsir can be tackled from a number of different ways. But the source and the core of what tafsir is, is for you to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. So as we have mentioned, that we're going to use tafsir ibn kathir. Now there are many tafsir. Many, many tafsir, many ulama that they went through the Quran explained in different, different ways. However, Imam ibn kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, is one of those ulama whom his tafsir is one of the most widely read and widely accepted tafsirs. Because you find a tafsir which maybe many people know about it. Maybe there's another tafsir which is very famous. Like Tafsir ibn Kathir, or Tafsir al-Tabari, or Tafsir al-Qurtubi. These are very famous Tafsirs. And they've always been written throughout Islamic scholarship, throughout the centuries. But we have chosen this particular uh, Tafsir for a number of reasons. In that it has been translated into the English language. At least a concise version of Tafsir ibn Kathir. This is one of the volumes, and it comes in ten volumes like this. Ten. And it's in English, alhamdulillah. So, m most of what Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned has been translated into a language that all of us, we understand. So it's something that you can follow. It's something that you can maybe, you can for the following week, you can read ahead. So that when you come to the lesson, if you happen to come to the lesson, you have an idea of what we're going to discuss with each other, inshallah ta'ala. And maybe there's something you don't understand. So this is something that you can use to go along with the lessons, inshallah ta'ala. So, Imam Ibn Kathir, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, was an alim who is, of course, not somebody who was from our times. He was born more than 700 years ago. In fact, he was born in the year 701 after Hijrah in a place called Busra, which is in Syria. While he was young, about four or five, his father, he passed away, rahimahullah. And he was an alib within himself. So he was an orphan. So 
Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, then at the age of five was moved to Damascus. Damascus. And there he studied fiqh and he studied other Islamic sciences until he grew up. Now, he had many great teachers, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, whose name was Abu Fida. Abu Fida, Ismail ibn Abi Hafs, Shihabuddin, Umar ibn Kathir, Ad Dimashqi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He had many famous teachers. Now, when the scholars have uh, given his biography, they mentioned 15, 17 very famous, well known scholars at the time, for many of them, but maybe we don't know who they are. But I tried to choose maybe six or seven that maybe we've heard the name before. For example, Imam al Amidi. Imam al Amidi, rahimahullah ta'ala, is a very famous book on Usul al Fiqh, Ihkam al Ahkam. Also from his teachers was Imam al Mizzi, a very famous scholar, Imam al Mizzi. In fact, uh, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he married the daughter of Imam al Mizzi, rahmatullah alayhim. Also, Imam al Dhahabi, a very famous alim. Imam al Asfahani, Ibn Asakir, who's got a very famous book called Tarikh al Dimashq, the history of Syria, or Damascus rather. And also, Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhim. They were all from the teachers of Ibn Kathir, as well as other great ulama. So, the teachers that he had are alam well known teachers well known scholars from islamic history ibn kathir within himself within his knowledge base was a great alim in if anyone was to ask you what was ibn kathir what was his if you like speciality you may say it's tafsir because that's maybe his famous most famous book but in fact what ibn kathir rahimahullah ta'ala was extremely knowledgeable and strong in was the ilm al-hadith the knowledge of hadith and in fact ibn hajar ibn hajar al-asqalani that he praised he praised ibn kathir for the amount of knowledge that he had in in hadith for example he said ibn kathir that he worked extensively on the subject of of hadith especially in the area of mutun of texts that he would be very aware of the texts of the hadiths as well as the chains and he had an excellent memory and his books became popular in his lifetime and people benefit, benefited from them after he passed away so this is a great statement from Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani talking about Ibn Kathir and when looking at his tafsir when going through the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, you will find that when talking about ayat and he brings a hadith, you can see that Ibn Kathir ta'ala, has extensive knowledge on hadith. Extensive knowledge. Because he goes into, if you go to, because this is a, what you have in English, is a concise version. I.e. that if you find an ayah, a verse, that Ibn Kathir might mention five, six, seven, ten a hadith talking about that ayah. When the person who uh, shortened Ibn Kathir, he didn't mention all ten. He might have mentioned two or three narrations so that it doesn't become too big. Alhamdulillah. So when looking at his tafsir, you can see that he was a great alim in ilm al-hadith. So he had great teachers. And as Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that he authored a number of books and they became popular in his life as well as after he passed away. As is well known that we're going to go through his tafsir Ibn Kathir. Also, he has a book called Al Bidayatu Wan Nihayatu, the beginning and the end. This book is a history book. And this is a history book from when? Badul Khalq, from the beginning of creation. Ibn Kathir Ta'ala, wrote a history book. The history book begins from when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation. Until his time. And it is one of the most excellent books on history. Why? What makes a history book an excellent history book? Isn't it just merely facts? 
isn't merely the person just saying this happened and then that happened and then he came and then he went and then this happened and then they lost this and then they found that isn't it just facts isn't that what history is possibly however you find many historians that they will have their take or their view on how history panned out and why it happened that this happened party a they came along and they had an argument with party B, group B. And there was an argument between the two because group B, they were troublemakers. This is the historian's point of view. He mentions that there was an incident between two groups. This is an example I'm giving you. There was an incident between group A and group B. Group B, they were the troublemakers. And they overcame and they beat group A. Which was an, an unfortunate happening. And caused great fitna. Now I've given a moral judgment on what happened there. Not only have I mentioned what happened, but I've given my couple of pence as to why I think this was right or wrong. Now, Ibn Kathir ta'ala, was very far from giving his own point of view why he thought it should be like this or why it shouldn't have been like that. It was very much, this is how it was, without any of his own influence on the reader. This is, it is an, uh, a most beautiful book on history. Also, there's another book called Al-Kamil fi tarikh by Ibn Athir. Rahimahullah ta'ala. This is also a very excellent book on, on history. Other books that uh, Ibn Kathir, Rahimahullah ta'ala, that, uh, that he wrote, he wrote a book called Al-Fusul fi Siratir Rasul, like chapters or stations through the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa It's in one volume. He also, you know, he wrote other books and numbering more than 20 different books on different subjects. Now we know that he adhered to a Shafi'i in his madhab in fiqh. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala said he was a Shafi'i. However, this doesn't mean that he was a staunch adherent to Imam Shafi'i's madhab. That whenever there was a fiqh issue, that this is the correct opinion and everything else is wrong and these are the evidences that we have and even though they have those evidences they didn't understand those evidences properly no he doesn't come across like this in his tafsir because when he's talking about ayatul ahkam when he rahimahullah is talking about verses of rulings he doesn't say this is the opinion of imam al-shafi'i and this is the correct opinion and everybody else is wrong but we do know that he did adhere to the method of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah because he has a number of books that he wrote talking about the ulama of Imam al-Shafi'i who adhered to that particular madhab and he wrote some other fiqh works uh, according to that uh, madhab Imam al-Zarkashi Imam al-Zarkashi was a, a great alim also al-Hafid al-Iraqi another great imam these were two of the students of Imam Ibn Kathir. Now when you look historically and you find an alim, he appears throughout history, you find that more often than not, that they have great teachers. And then more often than not, that they will have great students as well. So throughout time, Islamic scholarship has this chain. People don't just pop up from nowhere and suddenly become alim. It doesn't happen like this. You find that there is a silicon, there's a chain that this person studied from that person, and that that person studied from that person. And you can see that there's a rich scholarship within Al Islam. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he died in the year 774 in Damishq at the age of 74, and he was buried next to his teacher, Shaykh Al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, what I'm going to mention to you now, is because this is you know a general introduction i know you'd mentioned tafsir ibn kathir maybe you're expected to go straight into al-fatiha however before you pick up any book any islamic book that's dealing with any topic it's a condition that if you want to benefit from that book whatever that book is it's a shart it's a condition that you must read the introduction it's a must if you don't read the introduction of that book, you will not benefit from that book, even though you think that you have benefited. Why? Because Al-Muqaddimah, or Tamheed, the introduction, is the key to this book. 
how do I understand this book? How do I understand it? Well, why has he done that? Why, did he, why is he mentioning so many ahadith? Wait a minute, why is there weak hadith there? What's going on there? It's very important that you understand the uh, methodology of that author when reading any book. What I'm going to mention to you now is about 10 different points as to how Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, how he went through and explained the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First and foremost, what type of tafsir is tafsir Ibn Kathir? I did mention earlier, there's different types of tafsir. There's types of tafsir which focus on language. Like Ibn uh, al-Bahr al-Muhit. This particular tafsir would focus much on the language of the Qur'an. Or Zamakhshari, Al-Kashaf, which deals a lot on, deals with a lot of logic and has a lot of very strange opinions which, which are to be rejected, but deals with a lot of uh, linguistic issues in the Qur'an. You find a tafsir which deals or specifies on language and fiqh, ahkam rulings, like Al-Qurtubi. And then you find other hadith, uh, tafsir books, which are bil ma'thur, by narration. And Ibn Tafsir Ibn Kathir generally comes under that. Al Tafsir bil ma'thur. It deals with explaining the Quran by narrations. So, first, the point is that Tafsir Ibn Kathir comes under the type of Tafsir which is bil ma'thur by, by narration. So, this is very, it comes under the same uh, category as other Tafsir is like. Tafsir al-Tabari, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. And also Tafsir Ibn Atiyah. And Tafsir al-Suyuti. And also uh, Tafsir al-Baghawi. These types of Tafsir, they deal with uh, the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by narration. I'll explain what that means shortly. The second point is important for us to know regarding Tafsir Ibn Kathir is that he focuses on when explaining the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he focuses a lot on taking sources from a salaf, from the early generations. Now, this in itself is a very important and long topic. But many of the ulama, that they speak about the special, the, um, The advantage, if you like, that they had being very close to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those early generations, that they had an advantage and a special way, and an excellent way of explaining Al-Qur'an. So therefore you find, when explaining the Qur'an by narration, you will refer to the early generations. So many, many a time you will find that he, rahimahullah, goes back mentioning a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu then Sahaba and Tabi'een, and those ulama who followed that methodology. So he would mention narrations concerning explaining that ayah, and he would also add, because of his great knowledge in hadith, he would talk about uh, the authenticity of the hadith as well at times. He would talk about the authenticity. He'd mention the hadith, and he would say, وَفِي هَذِ الْحَدِيثِ نَظَرْ And there's something that we need to relook about the authenticity of that hadith, meaning that there is a weakness in it. Now before himself, before he began going into Surah Al-Fatiha, he has quite a long introduction. He himself wrote an introduction. What I'm mentioning you are points meant are taken from that uh, that introduction you will find that the majority of the uh, principles and points that he mentions at the beginning of this book are taken from where? they're taken from his teacher they're taken from his teacher Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala now Shaykh al-Islam is a well-known book which is uh, al-muqaddimah fi usul, uh, fi, uh, fi usul al-tafsir an introduction into the Principles or the science of tafsir. It's been translated into English. You can find it. So Ibn Kathir ta'ala, took many of the principles from his teacher and placed them in his introduction. 
that was the third point. The fourth point, that this particular tafsir, that it stands out in the way that it is organized and the way that it is set out. And that is that what he will do, rahimahullah ta'ala, whenever he can, is that he'll mention the verse or a set of verses. It's not just one verse and then he'll mention an explanation. He may mention a verse which needs to be explained alone or he'll mention a number of verses which uh, complete a particular point and then he'll go on to explain it. How will he explain it? The first thing he will do is he'll reword it. He'll reword it. Okay? You may find that because this is not kalam al-bashar, this is not the kalam or the speech of any man. This is kalam rabbil alameen. This is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The eloquence is above anything that you can imagine. So at times, it may need to be broken down for you to, to absorb it. We're talking about generations that came later, 700 years later now. For the Sahaba, for many of them it was clear. But for generations that came later and later and later and later, he intended to give a simpler meaning to that ayah, the point that was being made. So the ayah is mentioned and he will say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yuqulu li ibadihi mukhbiran. That he, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, informing us about, and then he'll go on to explain and break down the meaning of that ayah. Another beautiful tafsir that does this is the tafsir of uh, Shaykh Sa'adi, rahimahullah ta'ala. It's a very short tafsir, but he breaks down the meaning of the ayah and then it's easy for us to, to digest. Unfortunately, it's not in English. It's only in Arabic. So that is the first thing that Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, that he will do. After mentioning the ayah, he'll reword the ayah in a, in a simpler form for us. At times, after that, he will pull out another ayah from another place in the Qur'an and say this ayah is very similar to this ayah that we're talking about now. This ayah is very similar to another ayah where you find in so-and-so place, in so-and-so surah. And he'll bring them together and he'll mention the similarities between the two of them. He does this extensively through the tafsir as we will find inshallah. Then after he has mentioned, he has broken down the meaning of the ayah in his own language. And if there is another verse which explains that verse, i.e. using the Qur'an to explain the Qur'an. Now just a very short benefit, or you can pay attention to it, that here it is, you have the best of speech, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is the best one to explain the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who's the best one? The one who spoke it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this reason, it's a priority for us, and it, within the, the principles of tafsir, it's a priority that if there is another ayah which explains that ayah, this is what we, the explanation that we're going to use. We'll not use the, the speech of any man to explain the ayah over Allah Jalla wa'ala. So the first thing that you're going to do in understanding the Qur'an is use the Qur'an to understand the Qur'an. Then the next one who is best in speech is who? An Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa So if you do not find another ayah which explains that verse, and you may not find an ayah, then we will go to a hadith or the, the narrations of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to explain that ayah. And that is exactly what Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, that, that's what he did. That he would mention a number of narrations of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in explaining that ayah. So step number one is using the Qur'an to explain Qur'an. Al-Qur'an bil Qur'an. Then secondly, the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And then if there's nothing on that, then you would find statements of who? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum in explaining the Qur'an. And then if you didn't find anything from the Sahaba themselves, then who would you go to? You would go to the Tabi'in. But, as a point added, that you would go to those Tabi'in, who are the Tabi'in by the way? The Tabi'in are the students of the companions. You would take the statements of those Tabi'in or the followers who were well known to be students of well-known companions who are known for tafsir. Like Ibn Mas'ud, and Ibn Abbas, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhum, Ubayy ibn Ka'ab. 
Oh, Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, these are great companions known for tafsir. They had students. And these companions, radiallahu anhum, some of them went to Mecca, some of them stayed in Medina, some of them went to Baghdad and Iraq, like Ibn, Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu. They went all over the place, and they had students. Now from these students, there were certain people who stood out. Some of them, that they would make uh, statements, and throughout the tafsir, these names, that they will come quite often. So-and-so, Ikrimah. So-and-so makes this statement, okay? So, if you don't find something from the companions, you go to the tabi'un. But those well-known scholars from the tabi'un. And then after that, what do you do? Here's a bit of a difference of opinion where you can go. Some say you go back to the lughawi meaning. You go back to the linguistic meaning of the ayah, if that is what is intended. Or you go back to the shari meaning. You go back to the Islamic meaning that's given to that. Okay, so these are the principles that Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he, he followed when explaining Al-Qur'an. He also, the next point, is on occasions, he himself will say, this is what I believe to be the correct understanding, the correct opinion on the understanding of this verse. Maybe there's more than one interpretation of the ayah, but he will say, well, asah, that the first opinion is more authentic. So he himself will put forth his opinion and to be the strongest opinion. Many a times you may find he quotes a tabari, Imam al tabari, rahimahullah, who preceded him by 400, and, 400 or so years. Or he will quote from Ibn Atiyah or Ibn Abi Hatim who were great scholars who preceded him, he quotes from them quite a lot in his tafsir. Also, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he refutes the, young, the wrong usage of Israeliyat. What's Israeliyat? These are narrations that have been passed through generations from Banu Israel, which have no chain, but sometimes they're talking about a similar subject that we, we know as Muslims. It talks about Adam alayhi salam, talks about the beginning of the creation. Sometimes you find these narrations that were passed on. They can maybe used within tafsir. However, Ibn Kathir ta'ala, at times he re rebukes and says, no, 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 the usage of Israeliyat here is wrong. And as we go through, if you go to Surah Al-Baqarah in verse number 67, he talks about some of the Israeliyat that were used um, in the story of Musa alayhi salam when slaughtering the cow. Also, another important issue when, uh, in Ibn Kathir is that he deals with fiqh issues as well. Because inevitably, when you go through the Quran, sometimes you need to understand things from a linguistic mean. What, what is Allah telling us here? What is the meaning of it, first and foremost? So that will be explained. At times he will talk about verses which are dealing with ahkam, ahkam, rulings, halal, haram, halal and haram. The rulings of divorce, the rulings of marriage, the rulings of traveling, the rulings of prayer, the rulings of hajj, the rulings of inheritance. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he talks about some of these very important fiqh issues. Even though you will find, for example, the tafsir of Imam al-Qurtubi, which is far, far greater and bigger in size than Ibn Kathir, he deals with fiqh issues in great depth. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, he does deal with fiqh issues and mentions the opinions, but not as, of course, as in depth as Imam al-Qurtubi. However, he's very fair. You find he's very fair and very just when talking about these opinions. At times, he doesn't give the rajih, he doesn't give the, what he believes to be the strongest opinion. He mentions, for example, about the recitation of the Basmalah, when it should, there's five different opinions. He mentions the different, so he's fair and he's just. Which is one of the reasons, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that why in particular, you know, Tafsir ibn Kathir has had qubul, has had acceptance worldwide. It's one of those tafsirs that nobody says, oh, we don't accept that. Or oh, that's a funny tafsir, it has strange opinions that I should you know, adv I advise you to stay away from it. 
Tafsir ibn Kathir is like a very all-round, all-round uh, type of tafsir which can benefit everybody. طيب. That was just a brief introduction. What we're going to do now is <clears throat> what I would advise you to do um, is if you can get hold of Tafsir ibn Kathir, it's online. If you don't want to buy the book, the book is like 10 volumes, it may cost you quite a few pounds. You can get it online. And you can download the, the, the section that you're going to be doing or that we're going to be doing at that particular in that week. So you can follow. Or if you've got you know devices, you can have it in front of you. Okay? Uh, if you don't have internet, have it preloaded or have it pre you know uh, saved on your whatever device that you have so that you can follow the lesson. And it's very important that you stay in contact. Do you have contact with what we're doing? I mean that um, all of us, we have the ability to memorize and remember. Some of us can remember a lot and memorize a lot. Others, not so much. However, we're bashar, we're human beings and we forget. Even Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he forgot sometimes. فَإِذَا نَسِيتْ فَذَكِّرُونِي If I forget, then remind me. On one occasion, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prayed one of the dhuhr al asr, and he prayed two. He prayed two. And then he turned around, and he faced the companions. And then the companions were looking at each other, what's going on? And it was a man, his name was Dhul Yadain. They said, he's the man with the hands, because he had big hands. Dhul Yadain. He said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, has the prayer shortened? The Prophet said, no. He said, you just prayed two. Then the Prophet says, asked Abu Bakr, do we pray just two? He said, Naam Ya Rasulullah. We just prayed two. So the Prophet ﷺ got up, they all prayed the extra two rak'ah, and then that was it. They prayed sujood sahu, and then it was over. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm a human being like you that I may forget. If I forget, please remind me. So, if you can, if you have the ability to follow what we are doing, the first person to benefit is who? Is yourself. That's, you're the first person to benefit, believe me. Any person, any teacher, anyone, whether you're teaching whatever subject, the one who's delivering is the first to benefit. Why? Because that person has to prepare, has to read, has to ensure that, that what they're reading and then that what they're going to teach, that they understand. So... Because, I, you know, any teacher, you have to make sure that everything that you read, you have to understand it. It's not a condition for you to do that. Because you're not one delivering anything. You sit there and you may think, I understood everything that went in that lesson. And then you walk out and then somebody comes to you and says, did you write down or do you remember that hadith that, uh, that he mentioned? He said, what hadith? He said, no, 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 you, don't, you know that point that was mentioning about, you know, wiping over the, the shoe or the, the sock and... Yeah, I remember that, but I didn't. I don't remember any hadith. According to him or her, that they understood and heard everything. However, they understood everything according to their level of understanding. They understood everything according to their level of understanding. Their level of understanding is what is maybe quite low. I say this with due respect. I don't mean anything by it, but maybe your level of understanding is quite low. On that particular topic, not in general. On that particular topic. So you think I've understood everything. 80% has flown over your head, you didn't understand it. So I would advise you that if you can get hold of Tafsir ibn Kathir, then try to get it. If you can read Arabic, فَبِهَا وَنِعْمَ Then that's of course even a greater blessing because you have the origin. If you can't have that, then... Uh, you can't read Arabic for whatever reason, then you can get access to it in English, either in the physical form of a book like this, or you can get it online. Okay. What I will uh, advise you to do, inshallah, if you can read the, the Muqaddimah, you can read the introduction. The introduction is like 30 or 40 pages, but it is important. I've read it, alhamdulillah, I read it. But I encourage you to read it, because this is the key and I gave you a brief as to what, you know, the main points in the introduction and the kind of things that he will follow. But please read the introduction. 